I'd like to um, welcome you all here to UCL and thank you for joining us uh, for this special uh, lunch hour lecture to mark Holocaust Memorial Day. I am Ruth Ann Lenger and I'm Program Director of UCL Centre for Holocaust Education. This year commemorates the 75th anniversary of the liberation of Auschwitz and also um, commemorates uh, the liberation of the concentration camp of Bergen-Belsen. And of course it was that camp that the British troops discovered to their horror on the 15th of April 1945. So today uh, is a time to reflect on uh, those dark days of history and to learn from it. A history which is only just still within living memory. And thanks to the courage of Holocaust survivors who bravely retell with, I suspect, much fear their eyewitness accounts and also to outstanding trusting, trusted historians who with forensic detail and evidence-based interpretation trawl through hours of harrowing material, we are able to begin to comprehend as best we can about this deeply disturbing and tragic past. One such trusted historian <laughs> is UCL's very own Professor Mary Fulbrook, a renowned scholar of 20th century German history. She is the author of a number of influential and critically acclaimed books. Most recently, uh, her book, Reckonings, Legacies of Nazi Persecution and the Quest for Justice, won her the 2019 Wolfson History Prize. Today's lecture will be based on this work, and we're delighted to, the, to be presenting the lecture in partnership with the Wolfson Foundation, which is a huge supporter of UCL's work. We also want to welcome uh, the Pears Foundation, who supports the Center for Holocaust Education and is another great supporter of UCL. So Trevor Pears and Amy Breyer, the director, not only support the center, generously, but work directly with us to uh, bring about pioneering research-informed teacher training in Holocaust education across the country. <coughs> Mary is going to speak to us for about 30 minutes, um, and then there will be a small amount of time afterwards for one or two questions. Um, but as I'm sure you're aware, these lunchtime, lunchtime lectures are very short, and so there will not be much time for, for many more. However, after the lecture, um, we are holding an afternoon tea reception at uh, UCL Main Cloisters. Um, if you want to catch Mary then, you can. She'll be around. And staff of uh, UCL Centre for Holocaust Education too. And we will be giving you more information about that centre during the afternoon. And we'll be also unveiling a very, very special plaque which will... Uh, which to, in memory of a UCL hero who uh, saved Jewish children uh, from Czechoslovakia just before the war. So I'd now like to uh, ask you to join me in welcoming Professor Mary Fulbright. Thank you. It's a huge honour to be invited to give the UCL Holocaust Memorial Day lecture here, and thank you all for turning up on such a dismal, dreary day. Um, what my book is about, and I'm going to try and condense some of the key arguments and some of the key issues into this brief half-hour lecture, uh, it's about the legacies of the Nazi past for a wide range of different communities. I'm sure many of you here are in one way or another touched by that past, connected with that past. What I tried to do was to understand the significance for different communities, what I call communities of experience, which include obviously the survivors whose voices we've been hearing particularly this week, but also perpetrators and bystanders, people who lived through that incredibly challenging period and had to decide how were they going to deal with it, how were they going to face up to those challenges. Communities of connection, those who were born afterwards or who were further away, 
but who feel in some way personally connected with that past, perhaps as children of survivors, as children of perpetrators, as people who are close friends or family of communities who were wiped out, disappeared. And communities of identification, members of other communities who in some way identify with the Nazi past. For example, young Israelis who are taken to see the death camps in Poland, even though their own grandparents, great-grandparents, were never from Central Europe, didn't experience that period. And the significance for subsequent generations, for all of us worldwide, if we're determined that it should be never again. Uh, those of you with good eyesight will notice that I'm wearing my Never Again badge, Yuda, Jew, with a star on it, and Never Again. I was given this uh, a couple of summers ago when I was on a lecture tour in Poland, and that is said again and again, never again. But the question is how? Because we know from recent events, too sadly, that anti-Semitism is still rampant, is still everywhere capable of being on the rise again. So we're not doing very well on the never again side of things. And one, one of the things I want to try and do is to see if history can give us some insights into the conditions under which mass atrocities, collective violence, mass killing can occur, or the conditions under which more people are able to stand up collectively against it and try to prevent it. So. Um, one of the things I do in my book, which was going to be only one chapter but developed into the whole of part two, was to look at issues of justice, who was brought to account, who was not. And another thing I try and do is try and understand, despite the total incomprehensibility of this event, how it could happen. I spent years, as I'm sure many of you have, grappling with trying to understand it. And there's still that moment where you think, this cannot be, this cannot be, this could not have happened. And yet we have to try and understand how did so many people get involved in such mass violence that they were willing not merely to discriminate against those of their friends, colleagues, workmates who are now suddenly discriminated against, targeted, stigmatised, but actually to go to the death pits and shoot people into them. How can this happen? So that's the scope of the book. But I want to start really with this question of why has Auschwitz become such an icon? Why do we have Holocaust Memorial Day on the day when Auschwitz wasn't technically liberated? It was simply that the Red Army arrived there, found that the SS had fled, taken everyone who could still walk on the death march, and they just found 7,000 sick and dying prisoners still on the site. But we have Auschwitz in our minds as the epitome, the centre of the Holocaust. Why? One, because it was the largest single extermination centre. More than a million people were murdered there. That's more than in each of the other separate extermination camps. Two, I think, though, because those people who were killed there were brought from many different communities and nations across Europe and significantly, because Auschwitz was not just an extermination camp, but was also a labor camp. It had this huge network of subcamps. It had an enormously large number of survivors from all across Europe. So you get survivors going back to their other countries, their home countries, or going to America, going abroad, writing memoirs in a lot of different languages. So you have former Polish political prisoners, you have Czech, Hungarian Jews, you have French, Greek, a, a wide range of different kind of memoirs and survivor testimonies. So we know a lot about it. And the one reason why it's become iconic too, I think is a slightly disturbing one. It's got a lot that you can still see the remaining barracks, the remaining houses, and it's got very good transport links. One of the reasons why the Nazis chose that site in the first place was because great transport links. Forget about the myth of buried deep in the forests of eastern Poland. Oswiecim, the Polish town, was on a main railway line, and it's now still very well connected. Krakow, many of you may have taken a cheap flight to Krakow and seen those hideous tourist signs. You know, we will organise a day excursion and go to see the castle, the Varvel, go to see the salt mines and go to see Auschwitz. Auschwitz is thrown in between the castle and the salt mines. That always disturbs me slightly, but it does make it possible even for school trips to go there in a day 
you know, to just do a day there. Um, so the three pictures I've put up are the three iconic parts of Auschwitz. The two that we often think about are Birkenau, the famous gates into the gas chambers, the, the death camp site, and the Arbeit macht frei, the work makes free sign over the main political prisoners site. But also down there, not on the tourist trail, not even open to visitors to Auschwitz, is the site of the former massive IG Farben factory, the Buna Works in Monowitz. This is off limits for tourists now, but it's equally important because of the slave labor. And I think that is iconic. It does symbolize the Holocaust in many ways, but it also obscures, I think that it helps, and this is where I find it again really problematic. It assists the German alibi. We knew nothing about it. The sight of all that is truly evil is just the gas chambers of Auschwitz-Birkenau. What does it obscure? The Holocaust by bullets, as it's often called, across Eastern Europe, more than 2,000 kilometers from the Baltics to the Black Sea, more than two million people were killed by shooting into pits, into mass graves, into ravines, into specially designed death sites in the nearby fields and forests near to where they lived. They, hundreds of thousands more, died by starvation and disease in ghettos and in labor camps. And I think one of the things that Germans, post-war Germans in particular, tried to downplay was the incredible evidence of evil and inhumanity right across the Reich with forced laborers, slave labor, laborers, um, sub camps right across the Reich. If you think, for example, about the big concentration camp at Mauthausen on the Danube in Austria, if you go all the way along the Danube from Linz to Vienna, there are sub camps all the way along used by employers and local Austrians working in the fields would see the slave laborers being dragged along the roads, shot if they were faltering, falling to the wayside if they were too ill, too starving to work. So this was visible humanity across a far broader scale. The pictures I've selected here just for you to gain an impression, I, I find the ones on the left the little top one, really heartbreaking. That's a little boy on his third birthday with his new tricycle. He then is put into the Wutsch ghetto, the Litzmannstadt ghetto, and shortly afterwards, he's gassed in Shelmno, the first extermination center, stationary extermination center, killing people in gas vans. Below him, there's a man who's clearly been starving in the Litzmannstadt ghetto. He too is gassed in Shelmno. The middle photo is just one of the many relatively unidentified mass graves in Eastern Europe. That happens to be in the forests near Riga, where I was this summer. I just took that photograph. But you go through these forests, and there are these mounds, and they've made a little attempt to put a wall around to show where they were. But it's just horrifying, the, the extent to which that goes relatively unmemorialized, unrecognized. And on the right, this is just a, a regular SS guy on an SS camp in Poland, um, of which there were many, again, using slave labor from nearby ghettos and concentration camps. So the inhumanity is massive. And I think what we have to remember is that it's not just that tiny band of SS guards in Auschwitz. It's not just the relatively small numbers, the dozens or scores who are involved in running the extermination camps. It's a much wider machinery of persecution. And there is a step-by-step -step process. The book I'm writing at the moment, which is, arises from this one, I really start by the notion that what was absolutely unthinkable in 1932 was murderous reality in 1942. And how do you go through that 10 years? If I told you now to look at the person sitting next to you and anyone with blue eyes should shoot anyone with brown eyes, you would say, she's mad, take her off to UCLH, get the men in white coats. You know, but this is effectively what happened within 10 years in Germany, that center of civilization, a country whose culture we love, music, literature, and so on. So what goes on? Hostile environment is initially created. 
Um, by the mid-1930s, the legalization of discrimination, the Nuremberg Laws, some people are enthusiastic, the Olympics and so on. Others begin to feel apathetic and resigned. By 1938, I think that's when the watershed is crossed. Kristallnacht, November 1938, is when for the first time there is visible physical violence right across the Reich, synagogues on fire, shop windows being smashed in, Jewish homes being smashed up and plundered, and 30,000 Jewish men being arrested, carted off to concentration camps. And what does Hitler learn from that? He learns that a lot of people will participate, will go along with it, will benefit. Others will perhaps feel ashamed, will not like it, but they can't collectively act against it. And so what they do is you find evidence of assistance on an individual level, people trying to help, neighbours, friends, even people they don't know, but you don't get a collective response to the violence of Kristallnacht. And that, I think, is really the beginning of the end. That's the beginning of the Holocaust, in my view. Then you get the invasion of Poland, terror, the first use of Einsatzgruppen in 1939, but it's isolated incidents of terror to frighten Jews into fleeing, by and large, and it's targeted largely against Polish elites to deal with potential opposition. 1941, the summer of 1941, is when it switches from killing Jewish civilians to attempting to kill all Jews, and historians have debated that a lot. And then we get into what we think of as the Holocaust proper. A range of victims, one of the things I try and do in the book is bring out the wide range of victims, not just the larger single group slated for total extermination, the Jews, but also Roma and Zinti, the gypsy communities of Europe, the mentally and physically disabled, the first victims of gassing, in sanatoria within the Reich, gay men who very often didn't feel able to talk about their experiences after the war because homosexuality was still criminalised for so long, and even after it was decriminalised, many felt too ashamed to admit to why they'd been arrested and incarcerated. Uh, Jehovah's Witnesses and many others. Who was responsible? This is a quite difficult question. Obviously, the key men at the top, we know all the H's, Hitler, Himmler, Heydrich, and so on. Um, obviously, the real physical forces of violence, the Einsatzgruppen, the police forces, the ordinary men that Christopher Browning writes about, um, the decent army. The army had this long reputation of being decent, but it's quite clear that even if only 5%, the lowest estimate, of soldiers involved in killing Jewish civilians on the Eastern Front. The lowest, most conservative estimate is 5% of the army. If we take that lowest estimate, we still have 720,000 German soldiers involved in shooting Jewish men, women, children, babies, old people into mass graves. So there is this enormous number of people implicated in simple physical violence, physical killing, somewhere between three quarters of a million and possibly as many as a million people. Then the professionals who made it possible, who enabled that, and I won't go through all of that, but it's fairly obvious that people who are doing the planning and the organizing are just as significant in making it possible as the people doing the killing. The big debates among historians have to do with the role of ordinary Germans. Um, were they forced into obedience? Were they enthusiastic, consent, co coercion? All these kinds of um, debates have been going on for quite a long time. Much of the focus has been on attitudes and popular opinion towards particular Nazi policies. I think, personally, a more fruitful approach, which is the one I'm now trying to develop in, in my next book, is to look at changing modes of behaviour over a period of time, because you can see distinct differences. If you look at ego documents, one person acts quite differently in 1933 from how they've become in 1935, 36, 37. So I think we have to to look at roots over time as people change and change in their self-perceptions and perceptions of others. And we have to understand why so many bystanders remained passive ultimately.
In my book, Reckonings, I try and take some detailed, in-depth local case studies. You probably have never heard of Mirlets. You probably never wish to hear of it again. But I, I just got very fascinated by this ordinary place in Poland, south, southern Poland. Um, and one of the things I wanted to bring out, the reason I've put it up here, is I wanted to bring out one particular example from this. Rudy Zimmermann lived in a little area called a German colony of ethnic Germans. A whole pile of Germans had moved into that area in the 18th century. And he grew up as a not terribly intelligent son of a farmer, went to primary school with a lot of little Jewish kids who lived around in the neighborhood. When it came to secondary school, he was a little bit too unintelligent to go to the gymnasium, the more um, elite grammar school where the Jewish children with whom he'd previously played tended to go. And he just became the farmhand on his father's farm. Come the Germans, come the Nazi invasion, Rudy Zimmermann's day has arrived. They need him because he speaks Polish and German. So he can act as an interpreter in the Gestapo headquarters. Not merely can he speak both languages, he knows who the Jews are. So March the 9th, 1942, Jews are being rounded up, some selected for labor, some to go to Sobibor, where they will eventually be gassed. How do you know when you go into those houses who is Jewish? <coughs> Rudy Zimmerman knows, he went to school with them, he used to go shopping in the Jewish store, etc. So he goes running up the stairs and knocks on the door and says, hey, out, you're Jewish. No one can hide. Rudy becomes very, very important and eventually he's in uniform and he's doing shooting in the local Heinkel aircraft factory. The Heinkel works I also find very interesting because it's not as famous as Ige Farben, but it's very, very typical. You have a fa factory, you think, I need slave labour, great, bunch of Jews who can <laughs> do the work here before they drop dead of typhus, dysentery or whatever. Once they get ill, Rudy Zimmerman will take them into the woods and shoot them into a grave. When I visited that, I was fortunate enough to find a woman whose father still remembered where the mass graves were in the woods and had taken his grandchildren, this woman's <coughs> children, to see the mass graves one Sunday afternoon, but nobody else anymore really knows where they are. It was just an ordinary place somewhere in Poland. I'll come back to Rudy Zimmerman in a moment, but his boss in the headquarters was a guy called Walter Tormeyer, and he gave the orders to Zimmerman, so remember him. Witnesses to violence, as I said, all around, everyone could see. The bottom left photo, there are no fewer than six cameras visible in the full version of that photo. German soldiers were having the time of a lifetime traveling, hadn't been away from home before, go abroad, see extraordinary historic things, and they all photograph things like this, a public hanging. Um, Germans looking in at a shop front on Kristallnacht up the top, and a death march which somebody took a photograph of out of her window near Dachau. And yet after the war, we never knew anything about it. Why I like that particular photo is that the mother who is being forced to see these corpses that are just being exhumed doesn't want her kids to see it. She's trying to hide it from her son as they walk past. So post-war justice often called the era of the witness. Um, I devoted part two of the book to this because it seemed to me far more complicated than the usual story we have. We usually think Eichmann trial, Auschwitz trial, it's done. Oh, sorry, Nuremberg trials, Eichmann trial, Auschwitz trial, it's done. What strikes me is that it's actually not West Germany facing up to its past. It's a few individuals, and particularly Fritz Bauer, the Attorney General of <coughs> Hesse, who is determined to try and bring Auschwitz to court. And it's Fritz Bauer who gives the tip-off to the Israeli Secret Service, to Mossad, to get Eichmann from where he's trying to hide to Jerusalem, to put him on trial in Jerusalem. Because Fritz Bauer, who is Jewish and socialist but German, does not think Eichmann will stand a fair trial in Germany. He'll be acquitted or given a lenient sentence. And so it's actually very interesting. When you look at the 50s and 60s, West Germany is not really doing a huge amount other than trying to amnesty <coughs> former Nazis and reintegrate them in society, rehabilitate them. <coughs> Rough statistics on West German trials I find really quite shocking. 
99% of people generally who kill Jews, that's across Europe, were never brought to trial at all. In West Germany, more than 140,000 people were investigated. Somewhere around 14,000 were prosecuted, but fewer than 6,660 were found guilty of anything, i.e. received any kind of a sentence. And when you look at the sentences, this is what really threw me when I looked at this. If you look at the sentences, 164 people were found guilty of having committed the crime of murder under West German law. And nearly 5,000 people were found guilty of far lesser crimes with sentences of less than two years. You think six million dead and only 164 found guilty of murder. It's a quite incredible. I mean, we can play the figures any which way and there's a lot of dispute about the figures, but the rough proportions are quite extraordinary. So I think the thing that really came home to me when I was working on this topic was... West Germany has this massively good reputation for facing up to the past because it indulges almost obsessively, I would say, in memorialisation of victims. You go to Berlin and it's everywhere, the memorialisation, or indeed anywhere in Germany. And the second and third generation Germans are so ashamed to be German, they're doing anything they can to try and make good again, which you can't do. Uh, but the Nazis who were responsible were not brought to justice. Very briefly, just to mention a few aspects of that, a lot of professional groups evaded justice entirely. The Nazi legal profession continued into the West German legal profession, so you get former Nazi judges standing in court over their former mates and friends. The police, the continuities in the police forces also were quite significant. Germany chose to use ordinary criminal law definitions of murder as an individually motivated act and not the Nuremberg principles. It didn't want any retroactive justice. And the change in legal practice came after the Demjanjuk trial when it suddenly, for the first time, became possible to say simply working at a site which was solely devoted to mass death was sufficient to show you were an accessory to murder. Um, prior to that, you couldn't do that. You had to have actual eyewitness accounts to say you subjectively intended to kill somebody, not simply that you were obeying orders. So in some trials, like the Belgets trial, for example, SS guards who had committed 300,000 murders sending people to the gas chambers were acquitted because there weren't any survivors to prove that they hadn't had the subjective intention, that they weren't simply obeying orders. One guy was um, sentenced to four years in prison. It was held that he'd already had two years in protective cust in, in custodial, you know, prior to the, crime, the trial. And um, if you work it out, he spent a total of five minutes in prison for each person he had killed. If you look at it in that way, very short sentence. Um, the GDR, this is another thing I found very interesting while looking at it. East Germany, communist state, nasty place. So let's just lay that on the table. Stasi, wall, repressive dictatorship, communism. But former Nazis in the GDR were six or seven times as likely to be prosecuted and sentenced as in West Germany. And there were more severe sentences. So Rudy Zimmermann, who you will remember the ethnic... German in Poland, was sentenced to life imprisonment in East Germany and did in fact die in prison. His boss, who had given him the orders, went to West Germany and had a very lenient sentence. And this is where I nearly fell off my seat reading the judgment in that case, because Tormeyer had been, during his time in Poland, having an illicit affair with a Jewish mistress, which under Nazi views was racial defilement. And when Tormeyer was about to be found out in having this affair with his Jewish mistress, he took her into the forest, went for a walk and shot her dead. And the judge in sentencing him for this said he showed, this is where I really could not believe I was reading this, a West German judge said, he showed evidence of humanity because he did not warn her in advance that he was about to kill her. Can you imagine that? So this was in mitigation. It made his sentence slightly more lenient. So it, it, it's bizarre, this comparison, when you start really doing it at a micro level. <clears throat> 
Um, I'm not saying that the GDR was perfect in what it did. It did put formal Nazis on trial, but it also helped to hide some prominent former Nazis because he, they could be blackmailed, used as informers for the Stasi, or it might be too embarrassing to show that they'd been harboring former Nazis when they tried to pretend <coughs> there were none. Um, this I've simply put up because you will have probably all of you seen the photograph on the left of that little boy with his hands up in the Warsaw Ghetto. If you look slightly behind him, the man holding the gun pointing at, at the little boy is Josef Blücher. And there he is again in court in the GDR in the mid-1960s, late 1960s, where he was sentenced to death. Now, Josef Blücher, I find very interesting because like many other former Nazis in the GDR, he became a relatively nice, good citizen, a qu lived a quiet family life. Um, Zimmermann too, good communist after the war. And you get former Nazis in West Germany becoming good Democrats, good civil servants, former Nazis in East Germany becoming good communists. It's a very interesting phenomenon. Finally, the era of the survivor to the present. I think from the late 70s, there is a sea change in what's going on. A younger generation comes of age, comes to adulthood. We've got new media. We can do video testimony. It's a quite different sort of trying to understand what survivors went through. Up until then, survivors had been witnesses to the deeds of others. Now they're suddenly being asked about their own experiences and what it meant for their whole life stories. We have films and television series making this a matter of enormous public interest. <laughs> the TV miniseries Holocaust, which first showed in the US in 78, in Germany in 79. This brought it into everyone's living room, Meryl Streep. You know, it just suddenly made it understandable. Um, Spielberg's films, Schindler's List and so on, it becomes a big phenomenon. The word Holocaust is used very widely now for the first time to refer to this period. Collections of testimonies, memorialization of a far wider range of groups. Um, but I think what's interesting is despite this sudden obsessive interest almost in survivors, which is continuing to the present day, there is still a failure of justice. There is very slow, inadequate, belated compensation for forced and slave laborers. <coughs> Industrialists are resisting claims. It's only in the 1990s that they really start thinking, uh-uh, oh, oh, reputational damage, you know, American markets, we've got to do something about this. So it's way too little, way too late. The impact of involvement in violence is another thing I try and explore in the book is what does it do at the personal and the private level? Because we've had a lot of work on public memorialization. And I think what's really striking here is that survivors of persecution who were subjected to this incredible dehumanization very often have that notion of they didn't use what little agency they had. They should have tried to save their baby brother, their elderly grandmother, but they thought they were doing the right thing at the time, saying, you go left, you'll be looked after, I'll go to work. And then only afterwards finding out left was the gas chambers or whatever it might have been. There's this terrible sense of guilt um, and terrible difficulty after the war, even if they survived physically relatively intact, psychologically a terrible difficulty in even finding a sympathetic audience. The first couple of decades after the war, we all know the Anna Frank diary, but that was remarkable and quite unique. Most people who tried to talk about or publish their experiences find it very hard to find publishers and to find sympathetic audiences. Contrast that with the perpetrators suddenly they have no agency. They were only obeying orders. They didn't really want to do what they were doing. It, it's very strange that you can separate yourself from what you did and not feel guilty. And that comes up again and again and again on the perpetrator side. <coughs> if you look at the second generation, this is Rudy Zimmermann as a nice family father in East Germany, family snapshots with his kids. I went and interviewed one of the sons who is very little in these photographs, but was a middle-aged man when I interviewed him three years ago. Um, you look at the children of perpetrators and they have a quite different 
challenge in relation to this past than do the children of survivors. We hear a lot about the second generation in survivor families and their second generation networks and groups and so on. And children of survivors have very, very serious issues that they have to face up to. Often parents who they have to, in some cases, um, translate for. You've got many cases in America where you, the parents don't speak as good English as the children do, or they have to look after because the parents are in some way damaged. They, as one person put it, um, it, children very often feel that everything truly important in their lives happened before they were even born. Children of perpetrators have a different set of challenges. They want to love their father, they want to respect their father, and yet they have to utterly renounce everything their father stood for or they have to legitimate it and justify it and say, actually, my father did it for the right reason. It's a really difficult thing. And one of the things that became very clear to me exploring this is it's not just the psychological dynamics, it's the time and place. It's very different from you, for you if you're growing up in Israel or Brooklyn, New York, <laughs> than if you're growing up in Poland as the child of Jewish survivors. It's very different for you if you're the children of perpetrators in Germany or Austria even more so, where there are many, many other families who kind of can talk about it in the same terms than if you feel a bit isolated. So time and place make a difference. And memorialization and oblivion. What do we know, we who come afterwards, what do we see when we go as Holocaust tourists, if you like? Here I've just taken a selection of three photos. That's an East German image in the women's camp of Ravensbrück, which shows that emphasis on <coughs> solidarity in need. This was one of the first um, memorials up to homosexual victims of Nazism in Lollendorfplatz, which you will possibly have heard of from Christopher Isherwood's stories, Goodbye to Berlin and all that kind of stuff. Um, the Berlin travel traffic authorities initially didn't want that put up on its U-Bahn station, but they eventually allowed it. And now there are many such pink triangle memorials. This one I find even more interesting. It's not a memorial. I mentioned Mauthausen and the subcamps all the way along the Danube going to Vienna, slave laborers, hundreds thousands dying in tunnels. This is one of the tunnels hidden, tried to cover up. Um, when we tried to find it, we were told in the local village, there's nothing to see, there was nothing here, it wasn't there. And then a young waiter in Augusthof came up to us and said, well, actually, there used to be a place, but they covered it up. And we just asked a little bit, where is this place that we can't see anything if we were to go? And we found it, we trekked through the brambles and found this little tunnel in the hillside. And there are many, many of those across Europe, that kind of site where people died and there was nothing to mark it. And I sometimes wonder, I, I was critical of the incredible focus on Auschwitz as this concentrated site of memory. But I do actually wonder whether it's not a bad idea for us who come afterwards to be able to concentrate where we focus on and not for everyone to have to live on this soil which is just drenched in blood and suffering across Europe. And whether actually it's not a bad idea that you can cycle down the Danube without visiting every site where hundreds and thousands of people suffered and died. Um, that's Mialetz on the left, the beautifully tendered German cemetery paid for with American money, the, the Rudy Zimmermann family type um, experience. And on the right, where the Jewish synagogue was, a rough stone, which when we visited it, had a swastika painted on it. Um, so I don't think memorialization of victims is enough. And I think this research... Uh, you know, like all the research in this area, there are more questions than there are answers. So I'd just like to conclude with some of those questions, which it seems to me it raises. Um, I have a real question about how do you achieve justice after such mass violence? I don't think the German, the West German case is exemplary. Far from it, I think quite the opposite. I think the amnesties and reintegration of former Nazis is morally unacceptable and was not pragmatically necessary. It's often said, oh, they had to get the system up and running again. What would they have done without all the former Nazis? That is just a cover-up. I don't think that is true. There were a lot of people who were excluded from the civil service in the 1930s because they were socialists or they had Jewish ancestry of Jewish descent. They could have gone into those jobs in the 50s. They'd been excluded before on racial and political grounds. 
but they couldn't come back in because the former Nazis got their jobs back. I think there is a question to be answered there. Um, questions around silencing or addressing the past. Rudy Zimmerman's son, when I interviewed him, did not know that his father had murdered Jews. He did not know, even though his father was found guilty and sentenced to life imprisonment, his mother told him, told the family, that he was a victim of GDR injustice, the Stasi state, Stasi injustice. So he grew up thinking he was the child of a victim of communism, not the child of a Nazi perpetrator. And in some ways, he had an easier ride of it, as did so many other East Germans, thinking they were members of the anti-fascist state, than did young West Germans who labour under this terrible burden of a feeling of inherited guilt, which they're not. They're not guilty, but they feel ashamed to be German. So I think that comparison does raise questions about how do we deal with this in terms of the next generation. <coughs> And finally, the, the questions that I'm really grappling with now, um, how do we find ways of ensuring that the majority of the population does not stand passively by and do nothing in face of violence against minorities, does not do nothing in, uh, against discrimination? That is an incredibly difficult question to find answers to. Um, Explaining why people remain passive is quite a difficult problem in itself, but it seems to me that the kind of Holocaust education we have at the moment in terms of teaching tolerance and this, that, the other, doesn't really deal with the structural conditions in which it's easier or less easier to stand up against injustice. And that's something I think we all have to confront now if we're going to go for the, the never again and actually mean it. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Mary, for that brilliantly clear and immensely interesting lecture, and you left us with such pertinent questions. I want to go straight to the audience because I think we might have time for one or two questions. So perhaps if you could raise your hand if you do have a question for uh, Mary, and we'll try and get the microphone to you. I'll start with this lady in the middle, please. <coughs> Hi, Mary. Thank you very much for that. Um, a very dear friend of mine, now departed, alas, was an Auschwitz survivor. She was in Sorry, fact, can you start that again? I couldn't hear what you were saying. A Just very hold the mic better. Sorry, yeah. I don't know quite what it is. Is it on? No, it's right. Yeah. Is it on? Um, a very dear friend of mine was an Auschwitz survivor. She was the Hebrew and Jewish Studies librarian here at UCL. Um, she also managed, finally, to get, because she was involved in slave labor, um, a small pension from the German government, um, possibly the united, reunited German government. She had a brilliant son, um, brilliance evidenced by the fact that he became professor at a university, I think, in Paris at about the age of 24, unheard of. At the age of about 28, he committed suicide. Devastating. She told me that that was something that happened quite often to the children of survivors. Of course, I didn't know that until that happened to Trudy's son. What mm. do you or what is known about that as a consequence for survivors? There's um, quite a lot of research, but it's quite difficult to evaluate how generalizable it is from it because you, most of the research is based on cases of people who come into the sites of psychiatrists, psychologists, and not the much larger general population that lead perfectly satisfactory lives, if you like. Um, some evidence suggests that they're more like children of survivors are more likely to have eating disorders, either eating too much or too little because of the pressure at home of you must eat up in Auschwitz, we had nothing, that kind of thing. Um, and you get, to, in one particular family, I'm thinking of one son becomes grotesquely obese and does everything his mother says, and the other son gets anorexic. anorexic. Um, but the, the, that kind of research, it's very difficult because the people who've written about these cases 
are referring to cases that have come into the view of medics and psychiatrists, and there are probably a far larger number in the population that we just know nothing about and who are able to deal with these challenges. So I couldn't comment on your particular case. Simply, it is an issue people are looking at. Gentlemen, on the end row. Thank you for that interesting talk. I don't know whether you're aware, but there's uh, good evidence that the seeds of Nazism were actually started off in German Southwest Africa, where local indigenous group, the Herero, were almost exterminated. Mm -hmm. And some of their remaining skulls have only just recently been um, take, taken back to that country. Mm. There's quite a lot of discussion about that. The, the um, issue is the beginnings of genocide potentially in Southwest Africa in the early 20th century with the massacre of the Herero, but also in German East Africa actually, where there were discussions about letting people starve and you know, death by natural causes, if you like. Um, the, the research, as far as the historical debate, which has been quite lively, seems to suggest that there is no direct route from the, the 1900s, the first decade of the 20th century, through to the Nazi extermination, that there's neither um, a direct route through military cultures, which was argued by one prominent historian, nor is there a direct route through any other means, that actually the, um, you have to go for a serious historical explanation in terms of the combination of circumstances, causes, and developments in the 1930s and early 1940s to understand the origins of the Holocaust. So that, although you can find previous genocides right through history, I mean, there are scholars around the world working on genocide more generally, that particular massacre of the Herero does not directly lead to the Holocaust. Um, the issue of bringing uh, Nazi perpetrators to justice, it doesn't surprise me that, uh, I wasn't aware of the exact figure, six or seven times as many Nazis were brought to justice in East Germany compared to West Germany. My experience uh, as a student living in the Soviet Union for a period totaling one and a half years in the 1980s is, is very relevant to that. I remember reading in the press on a very regular basis, maybe every week or two, of the Soviet authorities uh, finding, um, this was within um, the Soviet Union rather than East Germany, finding uh, former Nazi collaborators in Russia, Ukraine, Belarus, and the Baltics, and the report briefly described what they did. And in every case, as far as I can remember, that individual, according to the uh, press, was executed. I found that, found that rather satisfying because I was well aware of what was going on in West Germany at the time. Mm. I couldn't comment on what the Russians did in terms of dealing with those cases, but it is certainly the case that an enormous number of East Europeans were involved in killing. If you just take, I showed you a photo of a mass grave outside Riga. If you just take two days in Riga, 30th of November, and 8th of December 1941, 25,000 Jews were shot into mass graves just south of Riga in the Rumbler Forest. To do that shooting of 25,000 people, you had 1,500 people involved as perpetrators, of whom only a tiny number were Germans masterminding it, and the rest were Latvians. And this was the case everywhere you went. You have auxiliaries, Ukrainians, Latvians, Lithuanians, and so on. Um, so there are vast numbers of people involved in shooting across Eastern Europe. I, I'm, I would be surprised if as many were brought to court and dealt with as you suggest from your reports. I mean, it may well be that they were, but my understanding of Latvia and Lithuania in particular is that precious few were ever brought to court and dealt with. So the Baltic states may be slightly different. <coughs> The lady here, but we will very, very quick, brief, to the point question, and then we'll have to conclude, I'm afraid. Hi, um, thank you for your lecture. Is it true that before the war, the Nazis believed that the answer to the Jewish problem was to send the Jews to Palestine? Because I've heard that, and I'm not sure if it's true or not. Okay, I, I think what you have to look at in terms of Nazi policies towards Jews is 
a progressive development of views and a set of improvisations. Hitler wanted Germany Jew-free. That's undisputed. The question of how to achieve that changed over time progressively. And there were various different mooted, either seriously or less seriously, plans for getting Jews out. A lot of what goes on in the mid to later 1930s is trying to get Jews to emigrate. So Kristallnacht, um, you know, the, the putting of Jewish men into concentration camps, many of them were released if they had emigration papers, visas had organised the incredible bureaucracy and raised the funds necessary to emigrate. So that was just getting them out. What then happens is that there are a couple of more serious plans which are talked about for a while. Move the Jews to Madagascar, where nature will take its lethal course, was one of them. Put them in a reservation in Poland. Initially, even before the summer of 1941, there was an idea that it'll be a short, quick war in the Soviet Union, and until the war is over, we'll just leave the Jewish question hanging. We can send them to a reservation in the Russian interior where they'll all die of disease and starvation anyway. The idea was really to get them out of the German area that was to be Germanized or become the living room, the Lebensraum for the Germans. And it was really in the summer of 41 that I see, I think you see the shift from these various improvised notions of how to shove them, move them, ghettoize them, replace them somewhere else, to the notion that actually what we should do is just shoot them kill them. And then when they start doing the mass shootings, particularly as it goes through August 1941, that's when Himmler becomes aware of the toll that this is taking on the killers. And it might be more humane for the killers to try and make a more efficient means of killing through the use of gas chambers. So it's improvisation, experimentation. And I think that crucial six months between the summer of 41 and the end of 41 is the moment where you see this changeover so that by late 41, they're actually designing and constructing dedicated extermination sites. So discussions about Palestine, yes, but more more significant discussions about Madagascar and about the Russian interior and about a reservation in, around Lublin in, in the general government of Poland. But this really isn't a, a sort of serious thing. It becomes, um, it shifts over time. I think that's why you have to look at the changes over time. Thank you all very, very much for coming here today. May I repeat my invitation to you to join us for tea? And finally, if I may, before you move, thank Mary very much for sharing your research with us.